that the fiery furnace for Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, yeah, he's not the guy that goes in, but uh, uh, he's the guy that in a bigger picture of things, God is really dealing with. And we saw that last week as uh, he brings uh, Daniel and now we're calling them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, into his life. Uh, God blesses them, gives them uh, 10 times the wisdom and so forth as the other you know, the rest of the Harry Potter gang that they're hanging out with it is really the, the advisors. Um, and, uh, and in that, exalting them to a position where they can be a witness uh, to him. Uh, you remember last week, Nebuchadnezzar has a troubling dream. Uh, it's going on and off for several years. Finally, he says to the, his wise men, uh, I need you to tell me what the dream is and then interpret the dream. And they're like, can we back up just a little bit? How about you tell us the dream and then we give you the interpretation? And then basically he says, I suspect that you may just be making that up and you've been may maybe, you know, duping me all along. So no, if you really know the future, you'll be able to tell me the past as well. And of course they couldn't. And then the threat to kill all of them, but God gives the dream and the interpretation to Daniel. He's exalted. And in that dream, as Daniel predicts, uh, and absolute uh, accuracy, the coming uh, kingdoms of the ancient world, beginning with Babylon, how they would be replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire, how they would be replaced by the Greek Empire, how they would be replaced by the Roman Empire, and then there, there would be a break in time. The Roman Empire really didn't end. They kind of crumbled from within. By the time the Visigoths and the Vandals and uh, these... Um, uh, those that came in and sacked Rome, they met little or no resistance. So that Roman Empire that just kind of dissolves, we know is going to get revived uh, in the end. And in the dream, it was uh, the part of the figure that was partially iron, which is what Rome was, partially clay. Uh, and there were 10 toes representing 10 kings. That is still yet future. The part that Nebuchadnezzar kind of clings on to, I'm the head of gold. I like that. I'm the greatest king. I'm the king above the other kings. So even though at the end, he praises the God of Daniel. In fact, in verse 47, of last, the last uh, chapter, he says, um, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and a revealer of mysteries for you're able to reveal this mystery. Uh, so what we're seeing in Nebuchadnezzar, maybe you've seen it with friends, family members, those you're witnessing to, they get a glimpse of God, a sense of belief in God, the awe of what God can do, and that the miraculous really does exist, and yet they don't really come to faith in him. Nebuchadnezzar is not humbled. Nebuchadnezzar never really repents of his sins, does away with the other gods and so forth. In fact, he takes the head of gold thing and and uh, we see his answer to God's revelation in the first seven verses. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, uh, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other uh, provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges... Uh, magistrates, aren't you glad they say all that twice? And all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music. And that's just a reference to, the, we'll talk about it in a moment, the Babylonians love music and tremendous orchestration is making reference to the, the, the volume of the music, how many players there would have been. It's kind of a funny phrase, and all kinds of music. Like they had a little rock and jazz in there too. No, it's, it's talking about the, the, uh, the size, the uh, magnitude of what's taking, uh, taking place here. Uh, he says, then you must fall down and worship the image of gold. And King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, whoever does not fall down and worship will uh, immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, uh, nations, and men of every language fell down 
and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had, uh, had set up. Every time I read this passage, I, I think about a, a, a very old Keith Green album cover. In fact, I tried to find a picture of it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an, an illustration. If you, you Be careful here, because if you're really old, see, so you're doing this. You remember it. That's an indication that you've been around the block a few times. But it was a, a picture of the, of the statue, uh, and, then, and then just the plains of Jura, and, uh, and all these people are, you know, down on their faces, you know, like this, and there's three guys kind of going like, <laughs> like, okay, what happens now? But uh, that's the, the visual of what's taking place here. Let's take out a little bit in terms of this is the answer to uh, God's revelation to Nebuchadnezzar. He answers by sending up an image of, of gold. Again, he is the, uh, of the head of gold, and so he makes the entire image. Obviously, this was to reflect his, his own power and his own glory and his own might and so forth. Again, one of the other little things that's uh, interesting here, we talked about the accuracy of Daniel, how Daniel would have had to live in this time period to be able to write what he writes is a thing we'd uh, go over pretty quickly. And that is the size of the statue. Now, uh, NIV that I just read says 90 feet uh, by 9 feet. That's the proportion uh, in a New King James. King James, it, it would actually leave it in the cubics, uh, which helps us a little more, and it would be 60 cubics by 6 and the reason that's helpful is because uh, the ancient Persians did not operate on a Greek 10 numbering system, right? We count 10, 20, 30, 40. They would count 6, 12, 18, 24. So it, you know, again, Daniel's accuracy in terms of the, uh, the language that's being used, that's the way it would have been built according to their measurements and, and language. He answers by demanding that his officials worship uh, this image and again, uh, you know, all the satrap prefect. I mean, this is a very well-organized government. I mean, there, there, there is a, a pecking order to this whole thing and a tremendous accountability. Uh, he is the absolute monarch, the absolute power, the, the, the head of gold. And uh, we'll see as we continue to study some of these other dreams in more details that the Medo-Persian Empire was really run primarily by the nobles and the princes, and the king had less power, but that's not to say that this government wasn't uh, incredibly uh, organized. And then we notice that his answer by terming a penalty, which is to be thrown into the fiery furnace. So a demand to be worshipped, a demand to, to be, have people you know, bow before him. Here's the, uh, here's the heart of man. Here's what power does uh, when... Uh, when, when we, we are given it because we have a fallen nature. That's why in our own government, which was established by Christians, despite what you might hear in your history classes today, but if you go back and read the original documents and uh, some of their prayer journals that they kept and so forth, uh, they made sure uh, that there was checks and balances because they believed that God created, but something went wrong. There was a fall, and man has a sinful nature. That's why we have a balance of power between the president, the Congress, and the ju judicial system, because our founding fathers believed what the Bible said. Power is corrupting. Jesus said the only way to escape that power is to be the servant of all. And, uh, and what we see here is Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold demanding to be worshipped. Again, the uh, instrumentation involved... Uh, typical of the Babylonians, they loved uh, their music, uh, they loved, uh, uh, they had developed and invented, there's only one of these instruments that we're actually even familiar with uh, in terms of a, a, a Hebrew look at things. Uh, all the others are the invention of the Babylonians themselves, and as I mentioned, that in all kinds of music is speaking about the orchestration uh, of all of this. Now, that lends uh, an interesting back note to uh, Psalm 137 when they go and they capture the, the Jews to bring them into the land. Maybe you're familiar with this, Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Babylonian captors, hey, 
<laughs> they're totally into music. We know you guys can sing, sing for us. How can we sing in a foreign land? Our songs were a song to God, and we're really being punished because of our own wickedness now. How can we sing in this foreign land? Nebuchadnezzar's answer to God's revelation was to set up this image uh, of a glory which really declared his independence from God, even though God miraculously intervened. I mean, the guy, I mean, this is incredible. He has a dream. He doesn't tell anyone. Under threat of penalty of death, someone's got to be able to tell him the dream and then interpret it. Daniel's able to do it. He's kind of praising God. I, I've seen it several times. I remember uh, a, a young couple that came in when I was still on staff there at Calvary Honolulu, and uh, their uh, young child, uh, maybe two years old, been diagnosed with, uh, uh, had, had a tumor show up uh, on an MRI uh, and um, diagnosed as uh, cancer and so forth. And <clears throat> we prayed. Uh, they were friends of somebody in the church. They weren't believers. But, you know, when you're in that situation, yeah, go for anything. Yeah, pray for me. Absolutely. So they had brought their child in. We, we prayed for her. Uh, three or four of us, and, um, and they uh, went on their way, and they went in, and they uh, did another MRI just to, you know, just double-check things before they were going to do the surgery and start chemotherapy and so forth, and, and the tumor was gone. God had healed. Boy, they just repented their sins. They got right. No, they didn't. They never even came back again. Their explanation was it all? Well, I guess the doctors misdiagnosed you know, it's very interesting, you know, how, you know, you know, we think, we sometimes think, you know, if, you know, my friend, my neighbor, this guy, I'm sure, if God would just, you know, move in the miraculous, if he could really see God operate, you know, in his power, you know, I know he would get saved. No, <laughs> not, not always. Uh, not with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, not with this couple. I, I, you know, I was kind of naive. I just, I was blown away. You know, I just thought, <laughs> Come on, it's your kid. God healed him, man. Uh, I'd do anything for the Lord if he did that for my kid, you know, facing cancer with a three-year-old. My goodness. But no, there was, a, there was another rationale. Nebuchadnezzar, well, God intervenes. God shows me. He's right. I am <laughs> glorious. I am the greatest. And instead of being humbled, he was, uh, he was exalted. And I, I've seen it in, in other occasions and other settings where God moved miraculously but had no impact. I was reminded of that as I was sitting in the, the session listening to uh, Pastor Chuck and and uh, Gail and David Hawking in the afternoon yesterday. And in front of us was a, a family there. And and uh, when I see them now, I look to see if their son is with them. Because I remember 19 years ago, actually 20 years ago, when uh, when they were, uh, they had a, a problem also. They were unable to uh, have children and had been married for quite some time. And same thing, I'm at Calvary Honolulu. I'm just one of those guys hanging up there praying for people afterwards. And, and usually we try to pray in, in groups. And that way it's, it's not my prayer, his prayer. It's just God gets the glory kind of a thing. But I knew them and they came up and they were concerned and pretty tearied and they lots of times at the doctors and trying to figure out, you know, what might uh, help and so forth. So, hey, let's just pray, you know, and we did and, and she conceived. And, and so as I see them, I always look to see their 19-year-old son that nobody said they could have. What was their response? They praised God. They knew God had intervened. There's a real difference there. God moves and somebody doesn't see it or denies it or rationalize it away. Somebody else obviously sees it, knows it, because of what's already in their heart in terms of their relationship with the Lord. And man, what a difference uh, it makes in their lives. And God gets the glory. Well, that's Nebuchadnezzar's response. God's not through with him. He's going to be confronted by what I'll call authentic faith. And that's in verses 8 to 18. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither, neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. 
Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God, then what God will be able to rescue from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Pretty, pretty radical. Again, we've seen uh, uh, already Daniel and these three young men that come into the setting, probably 15, 16 years old. They go through that three years of schooling and teaching uh, because of the gifting God's given them. They've been exalted uh, over the Harry Potter gang. And so we mentioned that uh, those guys wouldn't be real thrilled about it, although it was Daniel that saved their lives, remember, uh, by giving the dream and the uh, interpretation. Uh, but again, here, authentic faith brought confrontation with the ruling priest. Uh, when it talks about it's the astrologers that come in, uh, King James, New King James would say the Chaldeans, and we talked about that a little bit. That doesn't uh, really get it. It's, it's the ruling class of, of all of these sorcerers and wizards and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, if you've seen uh, or read the books, uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings, you remember the two towers, you remember the one king that was under the spell of Wormwood and so forth. That's what's going on here. It's an attempt to bring him under their powers. And, uh, and God's intervened by putting these four godly young men in his realm of influence to try to prevent that from happening. They're upset uh, they've uh, been slighted by what they consider to be three Jewish or four Jewish slaves. Uh, and so when he sets the, the image of gold up and demand it to be worshipped, they know, they know that these guys are not going to worship it. So they go, aha, here's our, our opportunity. And, uh, and yet, uh, when questioned, uh, they refuse to, uh, to bow down. And what they were doing then is what we would call in our vernacular civil disobedience. Now, they were supposed to submit to the governing authorities. We're supposed to submit to the governing authorities, right? Paul says in Romans 13, 1, that, that uh, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority that exists except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So it doesn't matter if you're living in communist China or you're, you're living in, uh, you know, in, in a Muslim country or you're living in the United States of America, you're supposed to submit yourself to the governing authorities. Except, except when that authority prevents you from worshiping God or prevents you or would cause you like them to actually worship this idol and go against your faith. Then you've got to submit to the the higher authority. We've got that situation in the book of Acts very early on. The Sanhedrin is called Peter, James, and John in for preaching the gospel. Uh, they say to them in Acts 5.28, and this is the governing authority over them, we give you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are going. We've got to obey God rather than man. It's nothing against you, O king, and, uh, uh, and everything, but uh, we're not going to worship the idol. Uh, again, with these orders, what happens to Peter, James, and John? Very interesting in verse 40. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus uh, and let them go. Let me explain the flogging. Today, in Jerusalem, you can go to the archaeological remains of the palace of Caiaphas. You can go to the, the bottom, lower level, 
in some very crude rocks, you'll see uh, openings where, where it was his torture chamber, where these guys were tied through that, and then they were not beaten with uh, the cat of nine tails that we're familiar with that, that the Romans used. They were beaten with rods. They were beaten 39 times. It was against the law to beat someone 40 times. You had to come one short of that because you were showing them mercy. And that's what's happened to these guys. Uh, there was in, uh, still there in Caiaphas' palace in the basement where this torture chamber is, there's a basin cut into the rock where the blood would flow. Some didn't survive the beating with the rods. Now, Paul had this happen to him on more than one occasion that he makes reference to. What was their response to this? Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, incredible, incredible. Uh, that's, these guys are going through doing what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going. Somebody asked me a, a few weeks ago about our taking Bibles into China and isn't that breaking the law? And, uh, and that's, the, again, the, the same situation here. Yes, it is. We actually <laughs> knowingly are, are breaking the law. You can take one Bible uh, in your suitcase when you cross the border for your own personal use, one and one uh, only. And we take a suitcase full. We are definitely breaking the law when we do that. But we feel like, should we obey man or should we obey God? The best that we could, we're trying to submit to the governing authorities that are over us in whatever country we're in. Uh, but again, Jesus has told us to literally take the word into the whole world. And that's what we're doing when we cross that border. So in that instance, yes, it is civil disobedience in the same way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did in the same way that Peter, James, and John did as well. Secondly, uh, authentic faith brought confrontation from an emotional uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we're going to see him fly into a rage here uh, uh, in a moment. But uh, again, he begins to question them. Are the charges true? Uh, here's another opportunity. Just bow down to the, the, to the music and, uh, and you won't have to be thrown into the furnace. And then they, <laughs> they, they refuse. And... Uh, uh, but again, notice that it's an emotional response on his part and not a logical response I at all. I mean, is it really logical that he could make a God and that God would really be God, one that we should be worshipped? Uh, it's, it's not logical at all. Uh, this is more of an emotional response. Uh, authentic faith doesn't waver uh, in times of testing. And, and three things about their statement that they make here, which is pretty incredible. And the first thing is their commitment to the Lord didn't demand an answer. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. <clears throat> no, I think you better get a good attorney. <laughs> no, you, we don't need to defend ourselves. This is just it. It's just, we're just not going to, we don't do this. You know, I mean, uh, this is why we're here in captivity. This thing about worshiping idols. It's why we got kicked out of our whole country and the whole thing burned to the ground. Uh, we're, not, we're not even going there. Uh, they, it says, we don't even have to give you an answer. Uh, you know, and sometimes uh, when uh, the emotional response from somebody attacking you, you know, in your faith or a stance for your faith, that's probably the best response. You know, don't really need to try to uh, give you an answer while, you know, while you're in this condition. Uh, secondly, their confidence is in the Lord. Verse 17. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Uh, again, God could save them from the furnace, uh, but the whole point is, uh, even if he doesn't, he'll save us from you. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, we might get thrown in and God is able. Our, our God is a God that spoke creation into existence. Can he save us from flames? Yeah, he can. He might not, but even if we die, we're saved from you because we're going to be with him. Uh, Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but uh, cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, sometimes we're fearing the wrong things in life, and we really need to have a, a reverence and a fear of God. They're just like, <laughs> you know, hey, he can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to do it. I mean, it's just, uh, he is being confronted with Again, what I'm seeing is authentic faith. 
<laughs> and, uh, and sometimes that can be po a powerful witness. Third, their conviction would not be changed. Verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. So throws in the fire if, uh, if you need to. And, uh, and uh, you know, again, we talked about, uh, <clears throat> you know, as we'll see Daniel in the lion's den. When these guys are crying out for mercy, there's, uh, you know, they know that God could save them, but yet you don't, you don't see him claiming or naming or demanding anything of God. No, he's God. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. This is what he's capable of doing, and we're just going to submit to whatever he wants to do in our lives. I, you know, from their perspective, <clears throat> maybe God wants them to walk in there and be charcoaled and burned for their faith in God, and that would have a tremendous impact on all these, the rest of the, uh, the captives that there in this, to hear about these three young men that were willing to die courageously for their faith. Man, we're going to stand with the Lord. In fact, that's what's happened through the century on many occasions, and the classic is, as we went through our study on church history of is Polycarp. Polycarp was a very important figure because he was a, he was a disciple of John the Apostle uh, and yet uh, was a young guy as John was an old guy. So he kind of bridged the gap. He was uh, born in about 70 <coughs> AD and uh, lived to about 155. Uh, at 86 years old, he, uh, he is arrested for his faith uh, in Christ and, uh, uh, and he's going to be burned uh, at, at the stake. And uh, and they're hoping that he'll just deny his faith. He's the bishop of Smyrna, and if they can kind of get him to denounce Christ, maybe they can squelch the, the growing numbers of Christians in, uh, in their area. Uh, but they refused. And then now they got a real problem on their hands because they are afraid that if they do burn him at the stake, the martyr's death with the good confession on his lips, this could actually <laughs> ignite the Christians uh, even more. So they're, they're just like... You know, they're really, come on, you're kind of old. Just, just deny the Lord, just like to us or whatever. And they're, they're trying to convince him not to go through this. And he, say, he makes this tremendous statement recorded for us in church history. He says, 86 years I've served Christ, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And, uh, and Polycarp dies being burned at the stake. And what happened is what they were afraid of. There were literally thousands that uh, came to faith in Christ in the decades and even the hundreds of years after that because of the testimony of, um, of Polycarp. Again, Nebuchadnezzar's answers to God's revelation was to build an image himself. He's confronted by some very authentic faith in these three young men. And then lastly, he's amazed by the miraculous. And we see that in verses 19 to 30. When then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards, uh, towards them changed, he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army uh, to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace was so hot, the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High. <laughs> Change his tune there a little bit. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and all the royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. 
Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble. He kind of likes that for some reason. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of, of Babylon. Again, but he's not humbled by the miraculous. He's only amazed. That's why I kind of use that term. He's amazed at what happened. I mean, he doesn't get down on his knees and repent and say, all my gods are false. I don't know what I've been doing. I don't know what I've been thinking of. <clears throat> Tell me more about your God. How can I worship your God? How can I become righteous? He doesn't do any of those things. Uh, but we see initially he's quite furious. He changes his uh, attitude. And uh, man, he... Uh, had to be an intimidating guy. This is the most powerful guy on the planet uh, at the time. It'd be like standing before Adolf Hitler or something and defying him. Uh, and these guys are the Diedrich Bonhoeffers of their, of their day, certainly. Uh, he's so enraged, they heat the thing seven times hotter. It kills the guys that are even taking them uh, up there. And then uh, he's amazed and changes his mind as he sees what he says, that four men in in the furnace, and one of them like a, a son of the, of the gods. <clears throat> and the bottom line is God's with them. God didn't prevent them from going in the furnace, but he went in the furnace with them. Sometimes God, in his graciousness, prevents us from going through fiery trials. But most times he allows us to go through the fiery trials, but he goes through with us. And it's a, 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 a great illustration of uh, what we experience so often in our own lives is as, uh, as Christians. It's not always easy being a Christian. I, I had to laugh as uh, David Hawking was sharing yesterday. He said he had led a guy to the Lord and, and uh, six weeks later the guy called him and said, uh, and said, you know, ever since I've become a Christian, man, I got all kinds of problems, man. There's all kinds of things happening. Can you undo this thing? <laughs> it's not always a bed of roses, but uh, the, the, the difference is the Lord says he'll go through those times uh, with us. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews says, in Hebrews 13, 5, a familiar verse, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's what these young Korean missionaries are going through right now in Afghanistan. As you know, uh, <clears throat> the pastor was the first one shot and that's why I'm personally very thankful for the United States Marines and others that protect us because these guys were fighting. I'm the first guy that's going to get killed. Uh, you think about the recent wars that we've had. It's uh, over ideology. It's a class of civilizations. And, uh, and we see it there in Afghanistan. They're there doing a medical, uh, uh, you know, mercy kind of stuff, helping people, helping the poor, providing uh, medical care where there is no medical care. The Taliban, as you know, uh, kidnaps them, and I think that two of them have now been killed, but we need to certainly be praying for them, but they're in the fiery furnace. They're, they're the Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednegoes of our day that uh, we're aware of. There are many around the world in prisons that we are unaware of, but at least uh, through the publicity of Western media, we know what's going on, and I just encourage you to uh, keep these young men and women in your, in your prayers. I... Um, it's interesting, I'll, <clears throat> Wednesday afternoon at the conference, I'll be, I'll be teaching on Paul's, the last recorded words that we've got, and one is, he's waiting to die, and he knows it, and uh, his biggest concern is that he'll die with a good testimony on his lips, that he'll be able to preach the gospel to Nero one, one more time, that's his biggest concern, <laughs> uh, incredible, and, and uh, <clears throat> like faith to these young men, and we need to make sure we're doing all we can to pray for the, the persecuted church around the world. They're still with us. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar is also amazed that, again, that God would rescue them. They notice they're not harmed in any way. Verse 27, they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. The robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. They trusted the Lord and defied the king's command. As he says, boy... This is authentic faith. They're willing to give up their lives uh, for their faith. I want to uh, have you turn to Psalm 91. I'm going to, uh, it's too long for me to put up on the screen, so to get your Bibles turned, just to read through. You know, we all go through fiery trials, and one of the things can 
really help you, really strengthen you is, is the Psalms. Because, man, David, uh, uh, the writers of the Psalms went through very difficult times. And uh, this is just a, a wonderful, a wonderful Psalm. And you may be familiar with some of the lines of it and not really realize where it's come from. Uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, you, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrows that fly by day nor the pestilent that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Here's a, verse 9, the if. If you make the most high your dwelling. Even the Lord, Yahweh, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He will tread upon the lion and the cobra. He will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Great psalm, you know, when you're going through it, Psalm 91. He'll command his angels concerning you. Is that true? That's true. New Testament, we have references to that we all have guardian angels. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've come to faith in Christ, you've got a guardian angel and some of you guys are working them overtime, I can tell you that. But uh, we've, we've all, all got them. God is, uh, is so faithful. Secondly, we notice that he's amazed and he praised the God of Shadrach, Meshach, uh, and Abednego. But again, he never humbles himself, never repents from his sins. Paul describes this uh, kind of behavior in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, uh, 7 10. He says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings, brings death. It's one thing to be sorry, you know, that you got caught or that things didn't work out or you wish they were different. It's another thing to understand that you're sorry because in what you did was an offense against the God who made you and is his image. And it's against him that you've, that you've sinned. And you need to ask his forgiveness and repent for him. And then... Uh, see things his way. That's called repentance. It's when I change my mind. It leads to a change in behavior, but again, repentance is a change of the mind. God says this, and I determine to agree with what God says instead of me and my way and what I can rationalize in terms of my behavior. Again, Nebuchadnezzar's answer to God's revelation, <laughs> build an image of gold, demand to be worshiped. Confronted by authentic faith, that just made him furious initially. And finally, he's amazed by the miraculous, but he's, uh, again, he's only, only amazed. I was um, reading through some uh, older Chuck Swindoll books that I've got, and I came across a, a story uh, in there. I'm glad he kind of documented it. It's in his book, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. And uh, in it, he tells the story of um, a group of Russian Christians that were still living uh, under communism and under tremendous persecution. And they had... Um, just received their, their first copy of the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, they just had the Gospel of Luke. And so they divided it up uh, among the families. And the idea was, you take it home, I'll take it home. I'll memorize this section. We get back together to worship again. We'll pass it around and we'll keep going and try to memorize the book. They had no way of uh, replicating it. They came back together the next week. They were worshiping, uh, worshiping the Lord and uh, and in comes uh, uh, two Russian soldiers, and uh, boy, it's, it's silent. And uh, they stand in the front, and they, they tell them, um, um, you know, what you're doing is an illegal activity. We're here to enforce the law, but uh, if anyone will leave right now, deny Christ and leave right now, no questions asked, just go out into the night, a couple of them leave. 
<laughs> then a few more. And then he says it one more time, a few more. Says it one more time, a few more leave. And then finally he says, if that's it, yeah, then lock the doors. They lock the doors. And, and then he says this, keep your hands up. But this time it prays to our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. <laughs> we too are Christians. We were sent to another house church several weeks ago to arrest a group of believers. And then the other soldier interrupts. But instead we were converted. <laughs> but listen to what he says then. We have learned by experience, however, that unless people are willing to die for their faith, they can't be fully trusted. Kind of puts it on the line. Swindoll goes on in, in his uh, chapter and says, In segments of the world where Bible, Bibles are plentiful and churches are protected, faith can run awfully shallow. Commitment can stay rather lukewarm. We obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It's good. It's a good story. It's a good story. Go home and tell your kids about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their tremendous, authentic faith. Uh, at the same time, think about Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, and, and this is the part that's amazing. God doesn't give up on the guy. <laughs> God doesn't give up on the guy. It's an incredible, incredible story that uh, God would care so much about this ruthless Gentile leader who's persecuting his people, but he refers to them as his servant because he's using them in the process and, and elevates these three or four young men just to try to reach the guy's heart. Uh, he's seen the miraculous and he's been amazed by it, but still not humbled. If we're not humbled before the Lord, I mean, that's part of what salvation is. They have that reverence, that fear of the Lord. Uh, again, Cheap grace is, is no grace at all. It was a high price that was paid for our, our salvation. And uh, man, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and pray for those that are in the fiery trials uh, even now, like those Korean missionaries uh, and others, and, and uh, realize you know, how important it is, our, our faith, and confront it. What would we say? What would we do? And, and you might think that, uh, well, I'm not really, really sure, you know, uh, would have I left uh, that uh, setting in Russia and gone out into the night and spared myself? You know, I just totally believe that if you really know the Lord, as Corey Timboom says, he'll give you the grace needed in that time uh, to do what you need to do to, uh, you know, to, to represent Christ. And like Paul said, his only concern was, man, that I would just die with that good confession.